know this is how we build a future. We do it together. And we build a future that works for all of us. of a movement, because it is a movement that will make a difference. I want to start by saying to American Family Voices, God bless you, you've been out there fighting. You've been out there shoulder to shoulder. When I try to get something done, I always knew I could turn to you and you would help make it happen. So I want to talk about what I think is the real question on the minds of millions of people right now across this country. And that is, who does our government really work for? Does it work for me? Or does it just work for the rich and the powerful? You want to understand about a playing field that's tilted? Right now, just, let's just think about two different groups. One group are people, oh, let's just pick randomly, people who make a lot of money uh, from investments in hedge funds. Um, okay? And they get taxed, we all know this, we've, we've been through this conversation, they get taxed at rates that are lower than those of their uh, secretaries. Okay? So we've got a group here that pays a very low tax rate. Uh, who makes up the difference in the billions of dollars that are lost in tax revenue because they got a special break on carried interest? Who makes up that difference? Well, I'll give you at least one group that makes up that difference. Everybody who took out a loan to try to go to school. The issue on the table in this country is whether or not we're going to raise the minimum wage. Whether or not we're going to say that people who work full time should not live in poverty. Whether or not we are going to give women and children a chance to pull themselves out of poverty. This is the issue on the table with minimum wage. This is an issue, and this is the key I want to raise with this. Who would be opposed to it? Why would we not have minimum wage? Why would we want people working two and three jobs? Why would we want to have, for all those economists in the group, a disincentive to work if working isn't enough to keep your family out of poverty? And the answer is because it may just nip a little bit into the profits of those who already have so much more. So once again, the question that we will face in a progressive movement is what choice do you want to make? Do we say in this country, hey, we're going to keep labor, the bottom edge, we're going to keep the bottom edge so low that people work full time and live in poverty so that you can boost the profits at Walmart? Or are we going to say we're better than that? We raise it so that those who work hard, who play by the rules, have got a real chance at least to get a foot in the door to try to build something for them. I'm tired of playing defense on Social Security and Medicare. People work hard, they pay into that system. For two-thirds of all Americans who are receiving Social Security, that's what puts food on the table and a roof over their heads. For 14 million Americans, it is only a Social Security payment that stands between them and poverty. And the debate in the United States for far too long has been, should we cut Social Security a little bit or should we cut it a lot? My friends, that is the wrong question. I got out here and talk about these issues. And two things happen to me when I talk about them. One, it's really true. It hurts. It actually hurts. Because I think every time I get out here about the people I talk to day in and day out who are profoundly affected by every one of these issues and so many more that we could talk about. I think about the young people that I meet when I'm just out, out on the trail, I'm sitting down having lunch in a cafe, any place, who come up to me and they talk to me about dropping out of school because the debt burden looked like something they could never pay off. 
I think about what it means when I talk to someone who's been out of school for two years now and can't find a job. The debts are mounting up, they're living with mom and dad, that bright future that was promised if you worked hard and played for the rules, they got nothing there for them. I talk to people who are in their 30s, in their 40s, in their 50s, in their 60s, who are dealing with student loan debt and it is crushing them. And I think about what it means that they live with this, not just every day, but every minute. I think of the people who are getting by on their social security and scared to death that it's going to be cut. I think about those people and it hurts, but the other part is it just makes me madder than hell. <laughs> I am in a room full of tough people. I am in a room full of fighters. And what this tells me is our time has come. conversation has been dominated by those with money, by those with power. The conversation has been shaped by those who have an army of lobbyists, an army of lawyers, an army of public relations people. It is time we have found our voice and we are ready to fight back.